I'd like to welcome you all to this public event, jointly organized by the Middle East Institute and the Institute of uh, South Asian Studies, two neighbor institutes in this building. Uh, and we see a, we've seen a growing collaboration between these two institutes uh, recently. And this event comes as part of it. Um, so I'm very happy about that. And um, two weeks ago, we had a conference comparing uh, cases of partition from the Middle East and, and, and South Asia. And today we are here for a comparison of two states from South Asia again and Middle East, uh, India and Turkey, which represent uh, two historical experiments, if you like, with secular state building in the non-Western non world. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor um, Sumantra Bose, who has just published this book, and you can buy it uh, after the talk there, uh, which, in my opinion, uh, sets up a very intriguing paradox for us, uh, which is that in the 21st century, Turkey and India are two, at least constitutionally, two secular states. But these both states are run by leaders and parties whose ideology is fundamentally um, anti-secularist. And the book responds to this paradox by delving into the uh, uh, long 20th century history of these uh, states and draws conclusions as to the future of secularism both in these states and in the non-Western non world uh, in general. So let me introduce Mantra Bose very quickly. He's a professor of international and comparative politics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. His many books include, uh, apart from this one, Transforming India, Challenges to the World's Largest Democracy, Contested Lands, Israel, Palestine, Kashmir, Bosnia, Cyprus, and Sri Lanka. Kashmir, Roots of Conflict, P Path to Peace. And finally, Bosnia after Dayton, Nationalist Partition and International Intervention. Very welcome to the Middle East Institute and Institute of uh, South Asia Studies. The floor is yours, Professor. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Serkan. And I'm really delighted to be uh, at NUS. And my thanks to uh, both the Middle East Institute and <clears throat> to the Institute of uh, South Asian Studies for uh, organizing this event. Um, as you know, this is a, a lecture that is built around my newly published book. Uh, just published uh, globally by Cambridge University Press. And as uh, Sarkhan already said, um, India and Turkey are, in the 20th century, uh, the two leading examples in the non-Western world of uh, explicit attempts to build secular states. Um, let me start with a working definition of secular state. Um, a secular state is a state uh, in which the constitutional identity of the state is not based on, derived from, uh, or tied to any particular religious faith, i.e. there is no official or state religion, and the state's constitutional identity, its fundamental character, so to speak, uh, is independent of any reference to any religious faith. Um, you've also heard uh, what makes the India-Turkey comparison particularly intriguing in the present conjuncture of the early 21st century, <clears throat> and that is um, that uh, these uh, avowedly, you know, quote unquote, you know, secular states, you know, as per my uh, working definition, um, have now been taken over, uh, are being led by parties and leaders uh, which are anti secular to the core. Uh, they are at the helm of these secular states. Uh, what an ironic turn of events. And of course, uh, what the ascendancy of these anti-secular parties and leaders 
to the helm of the two major examples of non-Western secular states um, signals uh, is a political transformation in both uh, these countries, um, but also the, uh, the underlying um, development is the rise of uh, anti-secular visions of national identity, uh, very different from um, in contradiction to the avowedly secular definition of national identity, which was the state-sanctioned version and the hegemonic version in both India and Turkey till recently, um, from the margins to the center stage. Um, let's remember that uh, less than three decades ago, um, the Hindu nationalist movement in India um, was a not insignificant but fairly marginal movement. Um, it was considered by many to be nothing more than a deviant extremist fringe of Indian politics. Um, likewise, you know, broadly speaking, for the Sunni Islamists uh, who have consolidated the hegemonic power over the Turkish state gradually, slowly but surely, in the last 15 years. Um, Turkey's first explicitly Islamist political party, Sunni Islamist political party, was formed as recently as 1970, uh, less than 50 years ago. So it's been quite a change. Um, <clears throat> beyond the working definition, um, the salient parallel to my mind between the Indian and Turkish experiments in building secular states both in the form of republics, the Republic of Turkey, established in late 1923, and the Republic of India, uh, established in early 1950, um, is that neither of these two secular state, non-Western secular state experiments um, followed uh, in letter or in spirit the ideal typical Western style principle of separation of church and state. Um, the principle of separation of church or mosque or temple from the state. You know, that, for example, is what underlay the American secular state, uh, which developed from the time shortly after the American Revolution, you know, 1789, 1791, 1802. Um, 1789, the American uh, Constitution uh, clearly says that no religious test shall ever be required of anyone uh, for any public office or position of trust in the United States. In 1791, there's the first amendment to uh, the American uh, Constitution, the first amendment, you know, literally, proposed by James Madison of the Federalist Papers uh, fame. Uh, which says that Congress, meaning the U.S. Uh, you know, federal legislature, shall make no laws establishing any religion or prohibiting the free practice thereof, i.e., there will be religious liberty for all, but there shall never be a state-established religion. That's the First Amendment. And about a decade later, in 1802, <clears throat> there's... Uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who in a letter, in fact, to a Baptist congregation in Connecticut, uh, uses the wall of separation term that the Constitution uh, and its First Amendment already sets up a wall of separation between the religious domain, between religious affairs and the state, and that is a sacrosanct principle of the United States. Um, there is, of course, the somewhat different you know, Western variant of France, um, which, from which the, well, which the Turkish state secularists tried to imitate in a very different context, in a very different era, in a very different way. Um, there, the separation is not as clear-cut in practice as it is, relatively speaking, uh, in the case of the United States, but there is an in-principle separation of religion and the state. 
Now, India and Turkey share this salient, you know, common feature uh, of not uh, being based on any version of the wall of separation doctrine. So what is it based on? It's something very different. India and Turkey um, are both uh, activist and interventionist you know, secular states, um, self-invested with enormous constitutional and legal powers to intervene in and regulate and even directly control religious matters, religious institutions, persons of religion, and so on. Let me give an example. On the very day of an extremely dramatic development in modern in the Middle Eastern history, that is the summary abolition of the caliphate after hundreds of years on March 3rd, 1924, the very same day the infant, newborn in a Turkish Republic, sets up an institution called the Diyanet, the Directorate General of Religious Affairs, which is attached to the Prime Minister's office, the Turkish Republic's Prime Minister's office, and whose head is to be appointed by the President of the Turkish Republic, uh, namely the founding president at that time, Mustafa Kemal, known from 1934 onwards as Ataturk, on the recommendation of the Prime Minister. And the Diyanet is invested with enormous powers to control the religious sphere. Um, and uh, you know, the ways in which it is invested with enormous powers uh, is described uh, in the book. And this started being referred to from at least the 1950s onwards by scholars of uh, the Turkish Republic and the Turkish model of the secular state as um, the control model, an activist interventionist state that controls the religious domain tremendous in a regulatory powers, powers of supervision and control. Of course, um, India um, never has had a perfect equivalent of the Dhyanath. There's never been a Ministry of Religious Affairs, you know, properly speaking, in India. Uh, but if you look at the Indian Constitution, for example, Articles 25 and 26, um, with its you know, various you know, sub-clauses, which are the most relevant in this regard, uh, you find that the Indian Republic and its government is invested with enormous powers of regulation, supervision, intervention, and control of the religious domain, um, all in the name of social welfare, reform, and progress, which is not very different from the Turkish rationale for investing the state with those powers. Um, the common theme here seems to be uh, that the state knows best. The state is the sole legitimate agent of modernization. Um, societies, and especially the very religious societies of Turkey and India, are riddled uh, with superstition, obscurantism, and various atavistic, atavistic practices. So for these new republics to make the transition from medievalism to modernity, from barbarism or something you know, similar to civilization, from backwardness to progress, um, from atavism to the future, um, it's necessary for the state to control and regulate religion in the manner it chooses. Okay, so if India, if the Indian and Turkish experiments in, sec, uh, in state secularism are not based on any version, you know, whether in formally or informally, but you know, quite the opposite of the wall of separation doctrine, um, then what is it based on? Um, this is the next step in my logical argument, which I try to. Uh, build in this book. Um, well, um, both countries are, of course, republics. Um, republics are built on essentially two pillars, you know, twin precepts, you know, one may call them. One is popular sovereignty, you know, ruled by the people, as opposed to ruled by a monarch or, you know, something of that nature. 
The second pillar, the second of the twin precepts, uh, is that um, all citizens are equal, you know, regardless of social status or background. I mean, this is the essential ideological legacy of the French Revolution, from which the republican form of government in all parts of the world is descended. Now, in avowedly secular republics, which India and Turkey you know, both are, this means that the state has to treat all religious faiths, denominations, sects, and all forms of confessional identity present on its territory in the letter and the spirit of equality. That um, without either discrimination or preferential treatment to any religious faith. Um, the state regards all religious faiths, sects, denominations, confessional identities uh, in, uh, as, as equal by law and equal in the eyes of the state, and none shall be subjected to either preferential or discriminatory treatment. This might be called the impartiality criterion. The state has to be impartial with regard to religious faith and other sect, denominational, and uh, confessional differences. Um, I would suggest to you, and this is a really important point, that the roots of the downfall of the secular state uh, in Turkey and the steep decline in the last two to three decades of the secular state in India um, lies in the fact that the impartiality criterion is much more easily asserted or professed than practiced. It's a very tall order. Uh, it's extremely difficult in practice to strictly abide by the impartial, impartiality criterion or the equality principle. Um, in the process, the secular state in both countries has faced accusations of bias and worse from the activists and agitators of various viewpoints, the majority viewpoint as well as minority viewpoints, and I'll elaborate on that a bit later. Okay, but let me um, outline to you um, the nature of the Indian and Turkish secular states after that uh, kind of conceptual uh, preamble, you know, setting out my framework of analysis. Um, in <coughs> Mustafa Kemal's lifetime, he died in November 1938, um, during the first decade and a half of the Turkish Republic, uh, the new republic, which emerged in what was the previous epicenter of the Sunni Islamic Ottoman Empire, a vast sprawling empire of uh, multi-religious, multilingual, you know, multi-ethnic, and indeed multinational uh, composition. During the first decade and a half of the Turkish Republic, um, the Republic was subjected to an astonishing series of um, secularizing measures. Um, it can be called, has been called, the Kemalist Revolution from above, uh, also the Cultural Revolution uh, in Turkey, and uh, by similar quite dramatic sounding phrases. Um, I've already mentioned the first blow, the summary abolition of the caliphate uh, in March 1924. Um, the second uh, major step was the enactment uh, of a, a new civil code in 1926, which was essentially plagiarized from Switzerland's civil code of uh, 1912, uh, and it replaced the late Ottoman imperial code which was a hybrid of uh, Sharia law and 19th century European jurisprudence. In 1928, uh, another kind of summary uh, deletion uh, of Article 2 of the 1924 Turkish Constitution, which had stated the religion of the Turkish state is Islam, and suddenly it was gone. It was struck off um, by uh, the stroke of a pen. Late 1920s, early 1930s, um, the Arabic script is replaced by the Roman script. 
between the early 1930s and mid-1930s, um, secularism, or strictly speaking, laicism, or laiklik, uh, is incorporated into the program of the single party of the early Kemalist Republic, um, uh, the Republican People's Party, or JHP, um, as one of its six arrows or guiding principles. And finally, in 1937, Turkey is formally declared a lacist or laic state. Um, that's the scale and the speed of uh, top-down secularization in Turkey. In India, as some of you will know, um, the 1950 constitution did not formally declare um, India as a secular state. Uh, in fact, uh, the word secular was inserted into the Indian constitution a quarter century later in rather inauspicious circumstances in an opposition-free parliament during Mrs. Indira Gandhi's dictatorial emergency regime of uh, June uh, 1975 through uh, January 1977. Nonetheless, it became a central tenet of the official discourse of the Indian Republic, starting from the mid-1950s, that India was a secular state in the pronouncements of its leaders and uh, much more. There is a bit of an irony here in that the terms secularism or secular state in any form were very rarely used in the discourse of the Indian independence movement. Um, I'm speaking of the Indian independence movement during its phase of mass mobilization from the early 1920s for three decades until 1947. But that India is a secular state that is religiously neutral, that sees all faiths you know, impartially, becomes a central tenet, you know, kind of hammered home repeatedly through various forms of official pronouncements and propagandas from the early 1950s onwards. Um, what were the motives of, uh, the, for the establishment of secular states in India and Turkey? And here, the similarities and the parallels end and the differences begin. Uh, now, those of you who are familiar with the basic methodology of comparative politics uh, will know uh, that uh, comparisons make sense when, uh, and this is a very small end comparison, it's a paired or twinned comparison, that comparisons make sense when there are some similarities and some differences. Because it makes no sense to compare two cases that are totally identical, they're carbon copies of each other, but it makes no sense to compare um, cases that are utterly different because it's comparing apples and oranges. So we have um, something uh, common here, which is two leading non-Western experiments uh, in uh, secular statehood, and their decline over time, indeed its eclipse in Turkey in the 21st century, slowly but steadily over the last 15 years. Um, on the other hand, we have very different historical contexts, political circumstances, as well as differences in the motives of the founding elites for establishing the respective republics as secular states. So what were the motives in the two cases? Uh, let me start with Turkey. Um, well, um, to the Kemalist elite that set up the secular state in the manner I just described a couple of minutes ago, um, there was only one form of modernity, and that was the Western modernity, as it was seen in very simplistic terms. Uh, one of the you know, very well-known shibboleths of uh, Kemalist dogma, uh, although it was actually stated by someone before the founding of the Kemalist state in 1923, 1924, uh, was that there is no civilization except European civilization, which must be accepted with both its roses and its thorns. Uh, in Kemalist discourse, the terms 
Western civilization and European civilization are often used interchangeably. Uh, but, and this so-called Western slash European civilization is seen as the only form of modernity. It's very important to emphasize this, that the Kemalists did not want to make Turkey like the West. They wanted to join the West as equal members. Uh, it's one thing me wanting to be like Europeans. It's something different and altogether more drastic for me to want to become European. I can become like an European, but look at me, I can't really become European, you know, can I? The way I look, the way I speak, and so on. Maybe that's a politically incorrect thing to say, but anyway, I'm speaking in a more old-fashioned, you know, kind of way, just trying to uh, make a point. Uh, in other words, the basic motive of Kemalist uh, secularism was to join the West as an equal member. Um, in the very simplistic, you know, Kemalist perspective, um, Islam was seen as something regressive, something atavistic, and the source of backwardness and failure. There was a very uh, clear inferiority complex, um, probably mainly rooted in the failure of the late Ottoman Empire, principally in the 19th century, to reform itself sufficiently, to modernize itself effectively, in order to keep up with and compete with its Western rivals, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the British Empire, for example. And of course, 1918, being on the losing side of the Great War, signaled the terminal collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Now, frankly, I don't see why there was a need for so much, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a sense of failure. Because after all, 1918 also signaled the collapse uh, of two of the rival empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which splintered into a number of national states, as well as the Russian Empire, which was replaced by an altogether different form of revolutionary state. But anyway, um, the Kemalists felt that the reason for uh, the Ottoman Empire's failure was that it was based at the end of the day, although it practiced a pragmatic policy of tolerance of diversity, including religious diversity institutionalized through the millet system, for example, that it was rooted in religion and specifically Islam. So if you look at Gamal's pronoun pronouncements during that formative period of the Turkish Republic, they are very critical and become harsher and harsher regarding the role of religion. You know, everything that is kind of primitive, backward, you know, useless, you know, rubbish. You know, he doesn't, you know, mince his words. Uh, it's a kind of unparliamentary language a lot of the time. Now, this to me is a classic case of throwing out the baby with the bathwater uh, because you cannot erase, you know, 1,000 years of your own history, just like that, it will never work. And of course, the history of Islam in Anatolia predates the rise of the Ottomans. You know, before them, there were the Seljuks and so on. So it's a millennium of history. And also in the process, there is a kind of total rejection of the, what may be termed in retrospect at least, the positive aspects, the usable aspects of the historical inheritance. For example, the Ottoman Empire's policy of pragmatic tolerance of diversity, which is completely lost because of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, now this syndrome of the Kemalists, which is their motive for setting up the Turkish secular state, um, uh, can be regarded as uh, Westoxication or Occidentosis. Uh, there is a term in Persian or Farsi, it's called Garb Zadegi. And it was popularized in the 1960s, i.e. much later, by um, a dissident Iranian intellectual called Jalal Ali Ahmad, uh, who criticized the Pahlavi regime of Iran for its alleged Westoxication or Occidentosis, Garb Zedegi, the 
copycat syndrome, the crudely imitative mentality, wanting to create a France in the Republic of Turkey, you know, borrowing the civil code from Switzerland, other codes from Germany, from Italy, you know, and, and so on. So in retrospect, one can argue that from its very inception, the Turkish Republic's form of secularism, its concept, its notion of secularism, lacked cultural authenticity, a powerful indigenous argument to underpin its legitimacy in the eyes of the people. This, I would say, is the first of two birth defects of the Turkish secular state in its Gemalist form, of course, which turned over time um, as the 20th century progressed into congenital maladies. What's the second one? The first, the second birth defect turned into a congenital malady. Um, not surprisingly, given the top-down nature of Kemalist secularization, uh, given its, um, uh, its kind of, uh, you know, West-inspired kind of uh, ideological basis, it had to be imposed on uh, not largely hostile, but largely uncomprehending population through very authoritarian and, in fact, even very repressive and draconian methods. Um, from the early formative period of the Kemalist state, one can speak of the Hat Law of 1925, uh, which outlawed the Fez and made it mandatory for Turkish men to wear Western-style brimmed top hats uh, in public. Now, this was seen as culturally alien by very many in Turkey, and it also caused certain problems for religious observance, for example, touching the forehead to the ground during uh, the, the, uh, the, the prayer uh, ritual. It was nonetheless imposed, you know, one can say, at the point of a gun, uh, protests against the hat law were suppressed. Um, some protesters were dragged before specially constituted people's tribunals, and executions of protesters took place both in the Black Sea region in the north of Turkey and in central Anatolia. Uh, of course, this sort of practice carried on you know, until five years ago. Um, there was this unresolved issue, an informal but very real ban uh, in certain public spaces of the headscarf uh, in Turkey. Now, uh, given that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, approximately two-thirds of women in Turkey uh, do wear some form of the headscarf. You know, there are multiple forms of the headscarf in public. This is a bit like telling Indian women that you're not allowed to wear the sari or the shalwar kameez, uh, that you have to wear the Western dress. Otherwise, you're in violation of the Republic's norms, and you're uncivilized and uh, unmodern. Um, okay, now the long unraveling of the Kemalist, you know, secular state, um, which really came to a head uh, in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, um, in fact, started in the 1950s, um, as soon as the era of single party rule by the JHP, the Republican People's Party, was, limit, uh, was replaced by a limited form of political pluralism. You know, as soon as even a limited form of political pluralism replaced you know, single party authoritarian rule, the Kemalist version of the enforced you know, secular state began to unravel in a long process which culminated in the recent years of this century. So that's the symbiotic relationship of Kemalist state secularism with authoritarianism. And these two, I think, the Westoxication and the authoritarianism um, are responsible for the effective demise of uh, the Kemalist concept of the secular state in the 21st century. What about India? Contrary to what Hindu nationalists claim, um, quite vociferously, the ascendant you know, political force, now uh, by far the dominant political force in Indian politics, in contrast to their marginal status uh, even a quarter century or so ago, um, um, 
the Indian experiment and the Indian conception of uh, secularism and the secular state is not West-inspired. It is not a Western transplant to an Indian context. I'm quite sure of this, uh, having done the research for this book. So where has the Indian conception of secularism and of a secular state, an impartial or religiously neutral state, come from? Uh, if you look at the pronouncements, you know, speeches, writings, you know, you know, etc., documents of the Indian freedom movement led by the Indian National Congress, you will find, um, and I'm kind of bringing a lot together here, that broadly two arguments are being presented for a secular state, even if the word is not being used you know, formally uh, in post-independence India. Um, by the way, although the term secularism or the term secular state is not being formally used, the commitment to bringing about one in free India is unmistakable. For example, in 1928, the Indian National Congress set up a high-level committee uh, to formulate the basic principles of a future free Indian republic. And it said very categorically, unambiguously, the Commonwealth of India, I don't know why it used the term Commonwealth, but it used that, the Commonwealth of India shall have no state religion. It's absolutely categorical, unambiguous. Three years later, the resolution of the Karachi session of the Indian National Congress um, says the state of the future of free India shall be neutral with regard to all religions. You know, the same thing, a slightly weaker formulation. Well, there are two sets of two arguments being given. One is the practical or pragmatic argument. It's that in an extremely multi-religious country, uh, a secular state is essential. Um, uh, the country cannot function unless all religious faiths are treated by the state in the letter and the spirit of equality because of the extremely multi-religious character of uh, the Indian subcontinent. Um, by the way, um, there is a misconception at times that Turkey is a homogeneous country or a largely homogeneous country. This is somewhat misleading because just as the uh, the point uh, that uh, India is you know, nearly 80% Hindu obscures tremendous complexity and differentiation among that 80%, um, leaving aside for a moment the other 20%, the notion that Turkey is quote-unquote 99% Muslim um, obscures enormous complexity and differentiation in Turkey's society, that Turkey is in fact rife with ethnic uh, sect, denominational, and ideological diversity. And many people, Turkish scholars, have very compellingly argued that the basic problem uh, with the Turkish Republic is that its monolithic character has been at variance with the plural nature of its society. Okay, the second justification for the Indian secular state, apart from the prag pragmatic you know, point regarding practicality, is that this is in keeping with um, an important aspect of Indian heritage and historical inheritance and tradition, which is the everyday coexistence uh, of a multiplicity of religious faiths. That this is not something that is foreign to us. This is not something that is inspired by any Western model of the secular state. We have an everyday ethic of coexistence, of a multiplicity of religious faiths, and the secular state after independence is, seem, is simply a continuation of that. It's in keeping with, our, with an important aspect of our traditions, our heritage, our historical inheritance. Now notice how different, how contrasting in fact this is from the Turkish case, which rejected historical inheritance for 1,000 years uh, at, you know, in one um, you know, fell swoop. Um, okay, so these are the two motives uh, that are being given for the Indian secular state. Uh, one other difference is worth noting. I've already stressed the symbiotic nexus of the Turkish, I should say, Kemalist uh, 
concept of state secularism with political authoritarianism, with repression, enforcement. Um, in India, secularism, or state secularism, I should say, develops not as part of an authoritarian polity or a semi-authoritarian or hybrid polity, as it did in Turkey from the 1950s onwards, but it develops as part of a flawed, as we well know, but functioning democratic polity. Okay? So secularism becomes part of India's flawed but functional experiment in as a democratic polity. Now this is very important, which means that secularism can't be forced down people's throats in the same way as it was in Kemalist Turkey, at least in the 1930s and 1940s, and fitfully even later. All right, what about, let me come back to the equality principle, the impartiality criterion. Um, the main confessional minority in Turkey, as some of you will know, are a group called Alevis. Uh, the Alevis are estimated to be about 15 to 20 percent of uh, Turkey's population, so a significant minority. About two-thirds of them are Turks, and about one-third, roughly, are Kurds. The Alevis belong to a particularly heterodox stream of Shia Islam. Um, not surprisingly, um, most Alevis strongly supported and even identified with the Kemalist secular state for obvious reasons. And most you know, Alevi Turks or Turkish Alevis still do because they prefer you know, that secular state concept to the majoritarian, religiously infused Sunni Islamist majoritarian conception of Turkish national identity uh, that is now dominant. But by the 1990s, at least, a lot of Alevis begin to feel that the Kemalist secular state has taken them for a ride, um, failed to deliver true equality to them, um, and used them as a vote bank uh, in a various, you know, you know, professedly self-proclaimed Kemalist, you know, well, secularist parties and leaders and politicians have used them as a vote bank, you know, down the decades without bringing true equality to them. And in fact, even when the Kemalist Republic was in existence, which I think it was for 80 years from 1923 to roughly 2003, and we are in the post-Kemalist phase now in the last 15 years only, uh, even when the Kemalist Republic was still in existence and uh, its hegemony of, you know, its secularist concept of, was unchallenged, mostly, um, the Kemalist secular state harbored a deeply ingrained strand of partiality towards the majority form of Turkish national identity, which has just become much more manifest now in post-Kemalist, you know, Erdogan's uh, Turkey. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think it's fair to say in retrospect that a great many, you know, pious, non-elite, non-metropolitan, uh, God-fearing, um, you know, Sunni um, Turks, as opposed to Kurds, um, felt, you know, Alevis start changing as well, you know, Alevi Kurds, you know, start changing their position towards the Kemalist secular state from the 1980s onwards when an armed Kurdish revolt begins against the Kemalist state. Um, but a, a lot of the pious, of the majority, quote-unquote majority population, the pious, you know, uh, Sunni, uh, non-elite, non-metropolitan, you know, ethnic Turks, um, they felt that the Kemalist secular state um, West toxicated and authoritarian is violating the essence or the real basis of Turkish national identity, which is the Hanafi Sunni you know, uh, identity of the majority of the population. And that has come back with a vengeance in the early 21st century. So in other words, um, the Kemalist secular state failed to kind of live up to you know, the expectations of either the majority or the minority viewpoints, and that's a, that's a simple kind of a presentation there. What about India? Let me say just a little bit more about India. Um, 
you may have read that there's a lot of uh, uh, problems. Uh, there's a problem with cows in India today. Um, you know, uh, there are people that are being lynched. They're almost always Muslims uh, for alleged, you know, cow slaughter and, and so on. It's happening, you know, every few weeks. Um, and uh, almost entirely in the BJP ruled states uh, of the Indian Union. And, uh, but this is a long, this is a long running issue. Now, in the second half of the 1950s, the most populous Indian state, then as now, um, of the Union, unit of the Indian, Uttar Pradesh, um, quickly followed by Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, or central provinces, and Rajasthan, uh, their state legislatures enact uh, blanket anti-cow slaughter laws, you know, banning cow slaughter. So by the late 1950s, you know, cow slaughter becomes um, uh, uh, illegal across practically the whole of uh, northern India. Um, uh, however, in 1955, uh, 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 a cow anti-cow slaughter bill to, for a national law banning cow slaughter that was brought to Indian Parliament did not pass, but these state laws did, um, and they are just as potent and just as almost as you know widespread. Uh, today, you know, in two thirds of India's states. Um, uh, cow slaughter is strictly illegal and punishable uh, under law by, by severe kind of uh, uh, penalties, uh, including hefty prison sentences. It's only in a handful of states and mostly smaller ones that cow slaughter is not uh, illegal. Now, way back 60 years ago, um, some uh, Muslim plaintiffs you know, approached the courts saying that uh, what uh, these North Indian states have done with their Congress governments, of course, um, is um, violating two constitutionally guaranteed freedoms, the constitutional right to religious liberty and the constitutional right to uh, occupation, you know, uh, uh, the butcher trade. Now, the Indian Supreme Court cons considers these, uh, you know, plaints and uh, rules in favor of the laws as reasonable restrictions on these constitutional liberties, mainly on the grounds that there is widely prevalent public sentiment on the cow and the cow slaughter issue. Now, of course, this does leave open the question of whether um, the, this is practicing you know, religious equality between religious groups, or is in fact favoring uh, a majority faith over a minority faith. Important uh, uh, point still uh, you know, uh, is, is, is there uh, to ponder. Uh, in the mid-1960s, the Indian Supreme Court passes another judgment um, which extols um, the nature of Hinduism as uniquely tolerant, uh, superior to practically every other world religion. Uh, by virtue of its unique ethos of tolerance, of elasticity, uh, you, know, you know, polytheism, etc. Now, this was in 1966. Thirty years later, in 1995, another judgment of the Indian Supreme Court repeats the terminology used in the 1966 judgment and says that not just Hinduism, but also Hindutva, which is the political ideology of Hindu nationalism, which first emerged in the 1920s and was elaborated in the 1930s, that is a way of life which cannot be equated with fundamentalism or religious bigotry. Okay, so, well, a bit, bit odd, a um, bit dubious, a bit uh, questionable. Um, in 1967, an important uh, Indian uh, official uh, who had served as the Attorney General uh, of the Nehru governments from 1950 to 1963, M.C. Setalvad, again locates the basis of the Indian secular state in the, this purported uniquely Catholic with a small c and tolerant spirit and nature of Hinduism. And this is someone who has been the top legal official of the Indian secular state from 1950 to 1963 during its, uh, uh, during its uh, uh, vital you know, formative um, phase. And this is something that becomes a staple of Indian state secularist discourse from at least the 19. 60s onwards. In 1999, the Congress Party, the grand old party of uh, India, 
then already fast losing ground, it's almost extinct now of course, but 20 years ago, fast losing ground to the Hindu nationalist BJP on the one hand and to regional or state specific parties proliferating across the union on the other, says that India is secular because it is Hindu. Okay? Now, um, this is problematic in my view for three reasons. Uh, number one, is this really a secular state that we've had since 1950? Um, which treats all, which sees, which regards, and treats all religions as equally valuable? Or has it been a soft Hindu state, okay, based on the purported, you know, uh, uniquely tolerant nature of Hinduism? The second problem is that it, as you might guess, it is actually demeaning to other religions, uh, especially Islam. Uh, but other religions as well, which are all set up in state secularist discourse, not just in Hindu nationalist discourse, uh, where it has a mirror image, which is set up, these other religions, notably Islam, but others as well, are set up as narrow, intolerant, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's demeaning. And the third problem is that there is a dangerous logical conclusion to this notion that the Indian secular state is rooted in a uniquely tolerant uh, Hinduism. It's that there is no need for a secular state at all. If Hinduism is so wonderful as a religion, then we can all live in a Hindu state where the intrinsic nature of Hinduism being so beautiful will uh, ensure a paradise for all. Hindus and non-Hindus alike. So what need is there for any kind of secular state? So, okay, so that's how impartiality or equality, I've just given you a few examples, a snapshot comes into, uh, into, uh, uh, into question in the, in the praxis of the secular state in India, just as it did in Turkey. Okay, um, I want to end with two you know, uh, points. Um, the defects in the Turkish case, or the flaws, or the anomalies the, of the Indian secular state go back to the respective formative periods, 1920s and 1930s in Turkey, 1950s and 1960s in India. But the process of desecularization of the state and of the conceptual basis of national identity in both countries speeds up dramatically in the 1980s, which is a very crucial political decade in both countries. In both countries, as uh, Sir Khan here will know quite well, the ascendancy of the majoritarian religious nationalist narrative and political alternative dates to the 1990s and into the new century. The stage for this is set during that crucial decade of the 1980s, which I remember very well uh, as, uh, as a boy growing up in, uh, in India. Um, what happens in the 1980s is that um, the self-proclaimed guardians since Turkey's first military coup of 1960, the, the high command, the hierarchy, the brass of the Turkish military, um, the self-proclaimed guardians of the Turkish Republic and its principles, above all, actually, the principle of lacism or secularism, um, the Turkish military starts promoting in the 1980s, it realizes that the original formulation of Kemalist secularism is way past its sell-by date. It's way past its prime, at least 30 years at that point. Uh, it's kind of... Uh, semi-obsolete. So they start looking around for an alternative conception of national identity which can be more effective. And even while swearing by the principle of secularism uh, and the Kemalist you know, notion of the secular state, for example, Turkey's third constitution, which is still in effect with many amendments, of course, of 1982, which the military uh, crafted uh, at that time after Turkey's most violent military coup uh, of uh, 1980, extremely repressive, um, you know, has many provisions to protect secularism. But at the same time, in parallel, throughout the 1980s, uh, the, the, the Turkish military, as the ultimate arbiters of the Turkish polity, um, which they were until a decade ago, 
um, begin pushing an alternative ideology called the Turkish Islamic Synthesis, whose name says it all, as an alternative basis for national identity and for social cohesion and for the state. And it's been 30 years since then. And um, what is today Erdogan and the uh, and the AKP's ideology is essentially still the Turkish Islamic synthesis ideology, which was pushed in the public domain by the self-proclaimed, you know, highly secularist Turkish military during the 1980s. What about India? You know, some of you will be familiar with political developments in India during the 1980s. Um, well, uh, starting in the early 1980s and into the mid-1980s, uh, the dominant uh, political figure of India at that time, as she had been since the end 1960s, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, uh, started experimenting with, uh, well, Hindutva majoritarianism as an electoral strategy. Uh, and she didn't uh, live to reap its dividends, but she left a legacy. 1986 was a particularly uh, significant year for the erosion of uh, uh, Indian um, state secularism. In that year, the government led by her son and successor, uh, Rajiv Gandhi, a political you know, greenhorn, did two things simultaneously. It arranged to throw open uh, the, the complex of the Babri Masjid, uh, the, 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 the disputed mosque that was raised in December 1992 by Hindu nationalists in Ayodhya, uh, throws open the, that compound to agitators um, led by the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, the VHP, which is the affiliate of the Hindu nationalist movement in charge of so-called religious matters, the Hindu nationalist movement led by the Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh, ORSS, of course. And almost simultaneously, very shortly thereafter, Rajiv Gandhi's government um, does something else. It moves to overturn uh, an Indian Supreme Court verdict um, ordering uh, maintenance to a, a Muslim woman, Shah Banu Begum, who had been divorced by her husband using the triple talaq, the instant triple talaq uh, method, which is legal in India. This is an anomaly of the Indian secular state. From the 1950s, I should have mentioned that, because the Nehru government in the mid-1950s enacted a set of laws which reformed and codified Hindu laws, also applicable to Jains, Sikhs, and Buddhists. Um, on matters of marriage, divorce, inheritance, and adoption, but left the Muslims and Christians to be governed by their own specific religious laws. And this, of course, is violating the impartiality or equality criterion as well. All citizens should be treated equally. Um, and uh, this has been one of the most potent weapons in the Hindu nationalist critique of the Indian state ever since that time, since about the late 1950s onwards, for 60 years. It's a very alive issue in India even today. Um, now, Shah Banu Begum uh, was this destitute uh, woman uh, in whose favor a succession of Indian courts had ruled, um, uh, ending with the apex court, the Indian Supreme Court. And uh, Rajiv Gandhi's government enacted a law in parliament uh, which you know, effectively uh, rendered uh, you know, Muslim women in India, it was called Muslim Women Protection of Rights and Divorce Act, Bill Then Act, which was rammed through by the brute Congress majority uh, in, in parliament. But um, you know, it did anything but what the title of that bill, you know, turned act, you know, suggests. It's undermining the rights of Muslim women to, you know, alimony, the rights of alimony and support uh, in cases of divorce, including the triple talaq cases. Now, what Rajiv Gandhi's government did during the second half of the 1980s amounts to parallel appeasement of dubious demands raised in the name of both Hindus and Muslims, both the so-called majority and a uh, the India's largest religious minority. Let me give another example, 1989, which was a land watershed election for India's democracy because it signaled the end of the hegemony of the Congress party in India's democracy and a new era marked by the ascendancy of the BJP on the one hand and the rise of regional parties also uh, on the other. Um, Rajiv Gandhi, who, well, swears by secularism, 
uh, swears by the secular ethos and the political legacy bequeathed to him by his grandfather, Pandit Nehru, and his mother, Mrs. Gandhi. Um, what he does, he starts off the Congress's election campaign in Ayodhya, the place where that disputed mosque was until it was demolished in December 1992, with a clarion call to establish Ram Rajya, or the rule of Ram, you know, uh, a, 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 a term loaded with, you know, religious kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, significance, if he's re-elected. Of course, he wasn't re-elected. And his home minister is said to have suggested to the BJP, uh, to, to the VHP, uh, the, the religious affairs arm of the RSS, uh, of the Hindu nationalist movement, that the prime minister, namely Rajiv Gandhi, be allowed to lay the foundation stone uh, of the uh, proposed Ram temple in Ayodhya. So this is how the Indian secular state, as in the Turkish state, was severely compromised and damaged, not by any rejection of the ethic of secularism, or even of the flawed, you know, uh, contradiction-ridden secular state by common people, but by leaders and elites, whether it's the military in Turkey or these Congress, you know, elites in India, swearing by the principle of secularism and holding themselves up as the protectors of the Indian secular state. Okay, um, final point. Um, will India go the way of Turkey? Uh, in the eclipse of the secular state in all but name. Um, this book has seven chapters, some of which Serkan has read over the weekend and into today. Um, there are two chapters in the middle of the book. Um, the, one is called Turkey, the Anti-Secularist Triumph. And the next one, or the previous one, sorry, is called India, the Anti-Secularist Ascendancy. So while in Turkey, the Kemalist secular state is dead in all but name and will not revive. Uh, even if Erdogan were to die tomorrow, the Kemalist secular state will not revive, you know, believe me. Um, the, um, in India, there has been this anti-secularist ascendancy of the Hindu nationalists, of course, and, uh, but the secular state, the future of the Indian secular state hangs in the balance. It's still open. And why is it still open? Again, you know, one needs to think of the differences between the contexts as well as the similarities. There are three differences, and on that note I will end, uh, because I'll have spoken for exactly one hour, and we need to leave some time for questions and comments. Um, one is that India, of course, is a much vaster country, not just in size, population size, that's a crude metric, you know, 15 times the population of Turkey. But even though Turkey is, as I said, a much more diverse and plural society than is often, uh, uh, than is often presumed, um, the scale of India's you know, diversity as a society uh, is just, of course, as you know, mind-boggling. It's, uh, it's dizzying. It's without parallel anywhere in the world. And this makes the implementation of a majoritarian political formula of Hindutva inherently difficult. That is why the Hindu nationalist movements languished on the margins of Indian politics until the end of the 1980s, uh, because its ideological framework was far too incongruous with the social reality of the country. The second big difference is about the institutional structure of state power, you know, how state power is organized. In keeping with the, with the authoritarian kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, tradition uh, of, uh, of, of the state in Turkey, Turkey has always been a, a highly unitary and rigidly centralized state. Um, now, this is a very dangerous consequence. It means that whoever is able to capture the center, you know, gain control of the center, gets all the power that's worth having. And once Erdogan and company managed to successfully neutralize the military as a competitor, you know, within the last decade, they have practically all the power that is worth having. And it's an astounding electoral record. Uh, you know, how many, six parliamentary victories since November 2002, all but one with uh, a majority uh, in parliament in the Turkish Grand National Assembly, uh, winning at least two referendums, 
uh, winning two presidential elections on the first round, uh, and, and so on. But it's the structure of state power that has facilitated that. Um, what Erdogan has done, you know, the continuities between Kemalist and post-Kemalist uh, uh, Turkey are striking. What Erdogan has done, he's taken the old repressive model of the state and just molded it. Um, the way I put it is that the bottle is the same. The, the label has been somewhat modified to get rid of the military's arbiter role and the emphasis, obviously, on secularism or lacism. And the content tastes different of the bottle, but it's still very bitter. It's a bitter portion, as intolerant of diversity, dissent, and opposition as the old uh, Kemalist portion. But otherwise, the continuities are extremely striking. Uh, it's the same uh, kind of uh, state centrism, you know, the Devlet you know, tradition. Um, the, it's the same um, personality cult of the leader, with Erdogan replacing Ataturk now, and it's the same zero-sum, winner-take-all approach to politics. Um, in democracies, including India's, which is a very mature and evolved democracy in many ways, the um, politics is eventually about bargaining and compromise with institutions playing, uh, being the mediating mechanisms. In authoritarian or semi-authoritarian systems, the ethos is very different. It's a zero-sum winner-take-all approach to politics, not about bargaining and compromise. India, of course, uh, had a moderately decentralized structure, Indian Union of autonomous self-governing states, founded broadly on the linguistic principle since the 1950s. Largely, that structure, that template of the Indian Union largely emerged by the early 1970s. And, uh, <coughs> um, <coughs> and Today, of course, 29 states, another seven union territories. Uh, so by comparison to Turkey, um, state power is much more diffused in India. Okay? That is why the BJP has to win one state at a time, and even more important, retain the, those states. It won't do to win a state and then lose it a few years down the road. That's useless. In order to achieve its ambition of pan-Indian you know, national uh, uh, hegemony. So that's you know that's a you know that's a very very uh, big difference in the in the two structures and of course Indian polit the Indian polity has de facto federalized since the 1990s with the decline of the Congress and the rise of the regional parties. So uh, the regional parties have their limitations, um, to put it mildly, but they also uh, tend to have loyal kind of support bases in their. Uh, various states and uh, and often you know very charismatic leaders as well. So it's um, it, you know it's way too soon to write them off. The last difference is something not regarding institutions. Democracy is not just about institutions, but also about attitudes, and attitudes not only of elites, but more importantly at the mass level, at the popular level, popular attitudes. And here you know. Um, um, very frankly, and Sir Khan may disagree with me, being from Turkey, um, I personally regard only the 12-13% of the population that's, that votes for a party called the HDP, uh, which is a mainly Kurdish party, but it has some support among uh, ethnic Turks as well, uh, notably secularist, but not Kemalist, uh, uh, younger, you know, highly educated, uh, you know, metropolitan Turks, uh, as the the really democratically inclined, you know, segment of Turkish society, and it's not a large segment, you know, 12, 13 percent, six million plus votes consistently in the last few years, but perhaps not large enough, uh, and the rest of the population votes either for Erdogan and the AK Party or for the JHP, which is still reciting the old shibboleths of Kemalism with its authoritarian uh, uh, traits, and or the even worse, a far right party called the MHP or the Nationalist Action Party. In India, by contrast, because it developed as a flawed but functional democracy, and also, as I just said, a de facto federal polity or quasi-federal polity since the 1990s, um, Popular attitudes are different. Uh, it won't be easy to simply you know, thrust a personality cult, uh, a zero-sum 
uh, winner-take-all approach to politics, uh, a state-centric you know, approach to politics based on uh, majoritarian you know, political ideological construct on the people. Because attitudinally, I think India is much more, well, diverse than Turkey is, and um, it's also a um, culture of dissent, you know, of opposition, uh, of diversity, uh, is much more ingrained, not just culturally and socially, but politically as well. So I think that for all its flaws, contradictions, paradoxes, and its currently beleaguered uh, status, the Indian secular state may yet have a future, unlike its Turkish counterpart. That is why uh, my last uh, chapter uh, is called, while uh, you, know, you can see the title of the book, uh, but the last chapter which Serkan has read uh, is titled The Futures of Pluralism in the, in the Plural, rather than The Future of Secularism. Uh, I'll end there. Thank you very much for listening to this long-winded uh, kind of uh, uh, a diatribe, and uh, we have a little bit of time for Q&A, fortunately, still. Thank you for coming, and thank you for listening.